Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Nice to see all of you again today. Uh, Mark Bailey, our president, is on assignment in San Antonio uh, today and part of tomorrow. But we are delighted today to have as our chapel speaker Dr. John Hanna, research professor in theological studies and distinguished professor of historical theology. Dr. Hanna has served on the Dallas Seminary faculty since 1971. His teaching interests include the overall history of the Christian church with particular interest in the works of Jonathan Edwards and John Owen. He recently uh, completed a history of Dallas Seminary entitled An Uncommon Union, Dallas Theological Seminary and American Evangelicalism. And he continues work on a general history of the Christian church. John remains active in church ministries and serves on the board of several organizations. His wife, Carolyn, who is here with us today, is the advisor to Seminary Wives in Ministry program here at DTS. They have two married daughters and six grandchildren. I would like you to join with me in welcoming Dr. John Hanna as our speaker today. My intent this morning is to deliver an applicational devotional with more emphasis upon application than text. (laughs) The history of the Christian church bears abundant witness to a significant flaw, repeated with dire consequences, yet with remarkable consistency of reoccurrence. What is it? It is the confusion of results for essence, the consequential for the causative. When it comes to the life of an institution, it has disastrous effects. When goals take precedence over meaning, purpose is lost, and self-existence becomes the focus of existence. When these are confused, that is purpose and means, in your ministry, there will be be unfortunate ramifications for you and those you seek to serve. When it comes to your studies at this school, the ability to separate ends from means, goals from methods, the ancillary, though important, from the essential is so vital that I have decided to raise the issue for a few moments that I have today. My subject today is the importance of distinguishing causes from effects, the separation of ends from means. If what I seek to address is important for life, your family, your ministry, and the people you will serve, what lens is appropriate for the task? What text of Holy Scripture might illumine the issue at hand? I think a possibility is 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31, through chapter 13. If you look at that text, Paul prefaces it by saying this. In this more excellent way text, the apostle argues that love is to be the inseparable motive and regulatory factor in the use of spiritual gifts. Abilities are not as much the priority as it is love. Spiritual giftedness without love as a motive for their use is empty. He says the same thing in chapter 8 about freedom. Freedom, unregulated by love of others, is the enemy of the good. 
When I look at this little passage, it seems to conveniently, though not purposefully, divide into three segments. In verses 1 to 3, this excellent way of verse 31 is described by what love in its absence sounds and looks like. In verses 4 to 7, he describes what love does look like. And in verses 8 to 13 of this little chapter, he describes why this discussion is so important. So verses 1 to 3, what the absence of love sounds like and looks like. We can all hear a gong. We know the text. In these verses, the apostle uses five comparative illustrations of love's superiority. Gifts without love are meaningless. Simply put, our ministries are more about showing than doing. Paul takes three spiritual gifts most prized by the Corinthians, motoric speech, prophecy, faith, perhaps in descending order of preference, to say that they are worthless without love to motivate and direct them. In verse 1, tongues is mentioned in terms of benefit to others. If I have not love, I'm a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. In verses 2 and 3, the gifts etched with obvious hyperbole are focused more on his self. In each instance, without love, without care for people, there is emptiness. Well, what does love look like if it is so important and essential as the sine qua non of our work? It is found in verses 4 to 7. These verses tell us three things. It tells us what love is. It tells us what love is not. It tells us what love does. These verses contain several descriptors, 16 by my count, of the nature of love. The apostle tells us what love is, what love is not, and what love does. What love is, it is patience and it is kindness. The first is an internal characteristic, the second an external manifestation. The first is what we endure, the second is what we do. They form an important couplet. Clearly, the Corinthians lacked patience in not waiting for each other at the table of the Lord or in taking each other into court. Kindness is the opposite of factitious divisions, chapters 1 to 4, tolerance of sin, chapter 5, legal conflicts, chapter 6, the demand for personal freedom to the hurt of others, chapters 8 to 11, the misuse of the Lord's table, chapter 11, and making spiritual giftedness a sign of spirituality and superiority, chapters 12 through 14. What is love not? Verses 4 through 6. We all know these things. Love is not jealous. 
Jealousy is the opposite of love because such a person seeks his or her own good as a priority over the good of others. Love is not braggadocious. The word means windbag. It is not arrogant. These two negative characteristics, boasting and arrogance, are two sides of the same coin. Jealousy is a sinful reaction to the prosperity of others. Pride and boastfulness is the sinful response to one's own success as though it were due to personal merit and superior efforts. Love is not rude. It does not behave poorly. It is interesting that the Corinthians behaved poorly. In claiming to be spiritually mature, when in reality they were carnal. To behave poorly is to act contrary to what is right, not self-centered. Love does not seek its own interests. It is not enamored with self-gain, self-justification, or self-worth. It is not provoked. Love is not given to emotional outbursts. It is not touchy. It is not resentful. Love does not keep notes on past offenses. The word here is the normal word for bookkeeping. What does love do? Verses 7, or verse 7, Paul links four qualities of love defined by the recurrence of the words, all things. Love is characterized by certain qualities without exception. Love bears up or endures. The verb has two nuances. Love hides or is silent about the faults of others. And love bears without resentment injuries inflicted by others. Love does not nitpick. Love believes or holds up. Love never forsakes faith. It is always willing to allow for extenuating circumstances. To believe the best, give, to give the benefit of doubt. Love hopes. If faith believes something is true, hope anticipates its fruition. Hope is the extension of believing, and it endures. Love does not run out of time. It lasts. The term is a military term, meaning to hold a position at all costs. In verse 8 through verse 13, you have the answer to the question. Why is love so important? The text says that love never fails. Love is eternal because God is love. It is a characteristic of God implanted in every believer and is the Holy Spirit. It is the essence of God's likeness. The contrast to the durative nature of love in comparison to the temporal nature 
of gifts, however significant and important, is made in verses 8 to 12. In contrast to love, spiritual gifts will not endure. Of the three gifts mentioned, it is said that tongues, glossolalia, motoric speech, will cease of themselves, being in the middle voice, while prophecy and knowledge will be done away in the passive voice, something caused by something else. The public gifts alone, prophecy, tongues, and knowledge, do not produce spiritual maturity. Only love can do that. To make the point, the apostle uses two metaphors. One is maturity versus immaturity, or immaturity versus maturity. And the other is looking through a polished brass mirror. To make the point, the apostle uses two metaphors to illustrate lesser versus better. Immaturity versus maturity, or human development, and indirect or reflected image versus direct image, a polished mirror, and immediate sight. Spiritual gifts without love is childishness and shallow, not mature or clear. The conclusion is verse 13. We all know these texts. And my prayer is that you will think about this text and think about your work. What abides in heaven is not spiritual gifts, but love. Faith believes. Hope looks forward based on faith. And love inspires both faith and hope. Love is greater because it will endure forever. Someday, faith will turn into sight and hope will be realized. But love endures because it is divine. My simple point is this, that you and I have been called by the divine being to represent him and to represent his character, to show forth who he is in this tragic world and who he is, is love. If you serve your people without love, you will be a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. If you have all faith to remove mountains, whoo, who wouldn't want to do that? I could replace Laterno. Old joke. Uh, that would be great. But if you do not have love, if you don't love your people, you're wasting your time. So I come to my last point. What does all this rhetoric mean to you, to me, to us? This is what I think. There are two very obvious insights to be drawn from this passage. The first is that God values character far more than talent and abilities. Even the talents that he has given us. Spiritual gifts honed by education and practice alone does not make a person spiritual. It makes them vocational. 
Abilities are not evidence of status or usefulness in the eyes of God. Have you not met people with enormous potential and abilities, but they do not possess character and therefore diminish their usefulness as Christians? I am saying we have put far too much emphasis upon spiritual giftedness and abilities, however important they may ancillarily be. Have you come to this realization? How would this insight affect your view of the work God has called you to? The second most important insight is that the most important character quality for us is love. It is love that is the key to successful Christian service, not mere giftedness. Personality without character might impress a potential employer, but it does not impress God. Does love characterize your social dealings? Have you met Christians that have an enormous amount of biblical knowledge but are untrustworthy for one reason or another? Third, love is devotion to others and their needs more than a devotion to one's own self-interests. As you think through the 15 characteristics of love, how do you measure up? All of us are imperfect lovers. In what facets of love are you strong? In what areas do you need to consciously work on and improve? Only Jesus was perfect love manifest in the flesh. Four, spiritual gifts exercised without the kind of love Paul describes is deficient. The root of most, if not all, of our social failings is found in a deficit of love. The importance of love is captured by the fact that it is eternal because it is the very character of God. If you are deficient in loving, use people as tools. There can only be two remedies. Low qualities of love may suggest that you have serious issues to work on in your life, asking God's help in correcting them. Or it may indicate something far more serious. You cannot manifest love if you have not experienced it yourself. Have you experienced the love of God through the mercies of the Lord Jesus? If not, the kind of love described in this chapter is impossible to know or show. Five, it is interesting that the three greatest virtues are faith, hope, and love. Of these, two are not enduring. Only one is love. There will no longer be a need for faith in heaven because the object of our faith will be realized. There will be no need for hope in heaven because all that we have longed for will be ours. But love will exist in heaven. Heaven is a place of love. Can you even imagine what a, what a, world, what a world would be where there is only love? Are you excited about finding out? Imagine a place 
where there will be no more jealousy and rudeness, simply unhindered acceptance and mutual self-giving. Six, what would our marriages look like if the characteristic of love described in this chapter were evident? How would you say that your marriage would be different? What needs to change to make it different? Would you pick one thing that would make your marriage different and work on it? When are we going to put away childish behavioral patterns, the toys of immaturity, or distorted reflections of reality, and exercise maturity in our social relationships? And finally, the way to accomplish these things is not through determining to do it, making strong or strident re resolutions. That is merely turning inside yourself where the problem lies in the first place. You must take your deficiencies to the foot of the cross and there ask for forgiveness and grace from God that he would melt your heart to obedience. Have you done that? Will you do that? The solutions to the problems of life is not to look inward, self-help theories, or outward, the help of others, but to look up to God. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We as a faculty long that you might have a quality, qualitative ministry. Could it be that your enormous giftedness, both natural and special, will stand in the way of your effectiveness? We sure hope the answer is no. If we have not love, we are, we are a, as a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. We ask our Father, as an extension of your grace and mercy to us, that as it is that we have experienced the love of God so deep and profound, that you would cause that love within us to swell up to love others. Might at the end of our ministries it be said, not that we were talented, that we had a remarkable church, but that we loved people, for love is of God. And all those who love are born of God. This we know, our Father. Bless these human words to the heart of all of us, for Jesus' sake, amen.